All right, we're going to look at organizing your research and basically try to figure out how to lay it all out. Hopefully you've gotten some information through the library's databases or you've done an interview yourself, read a few books, maybe you have gone and conducted a survey and are gathering data to make it useful. So hopefully this will give you some direction on what to do with all of that stuff as well as how to take it and formulate it in a way that makes the most sense for your audience. So let's look at some of the things that we need in order to be organized for this speech. Organizing ideas into a well-structured outline, or basically the body of your speech, is what we're looking at here. So we're trying to figure out what our main points are and what the subpoints might be. So with our research and with this organization, we are going to identify and organize anywhere from two to four main points. Most of you are going to have three or four, but it depends on your topic and, and the nature of it and how it fits all together with the informative side and the persuasive side. So in general, you're probably going to have three or four, but it may be a little different for each of you. We're also going to finalize a thesis statement. We are going to look at how to develop main points and then create transitions between them and then later on talk about outlining the body of the speech. And so all of these things together kind of co correlate to make a overall component of the speech that will help you to follow along while you're speaking and I hope make sure that your audience can keep track. Because it's a little difficult as an audience member to keep track of someone's message when you are just listening to it compared to if you were reading straight from, say, an essay. So let's look at the first point here, and that's to identify. So figure out, well, what are our main points in the first place? Now keep in mind, you have to have one informative main point. So one piece that is purely informative. It's not persuasive in any way, shape, or form. It's purely informative. So one informative main point, and then anywhere from two to four persuasive main points. So let's look at some of the things that you can use to identify the main points. First, list all ideas that are related to your speech goal. Now remember, your speech goal is that specific purpose statement. I am here to guide you through the myths of the pit bull. What are the overarching desires of that speech? Anything that is linked to that, list it out like a brainstorm. If you've ever done a web or you've just taken a blank sheet of paper and started writing stuff that pops into your head, start there. So if I was doing it for me, I might say, okay, I'm here to guide you through the myths of the pit bull. Well, there's this myth and and there's this myth, and a lot of people think this, and I would just start writing all of these things down, anything that relates to my goal. Now, once I do that, I can combine and eliminate ideas. So I may have a page full of stuff. If you have a page full of stuff, maybe you want to start to combine things. Now, one thing I've done in the past, and I found it really useful, is I have done some color coding. So I would take a blank sheet of paper and I would just spill anything that came into my mind about my topic onto that blank sheet of paper. Then I would pick one that I thought was the most important. Let's say for the myth of the pit bull, I found that naturally aggressive is a myth. And I think that's probably a big myth and I really know for sure I want to talk about it. So I might take a, say, a green pencil or a green colored pencil or a green marker or whatever, something that is a specific color, and I would circle that, natural aggression. And then I would go through my, sh my sheet of paper, and I would find anything that has anything to do with natural aggression, and I would circle it in green. You could also do this with highlighters. But if it had to do with natural aggression, it would be circled in the same color as the words natural aggression. Then once I was done with that, I'd go back and say, all right, is there anything else that seems like it's a big deal? And I would look through and I would say, um, good fighting dogs. I would say maybe that's one. And I would circle it in red. And then I would go through and find anything I could find in my, my notes or in my brainstorming that had anything to do with fighting dogs. And I would circle it in red. This helps me to combine ideas and eliminate things that are sort of outliers that don't matter or even put them to the side for an introduction or a conclusion. Okay, So eliminating ideas, combining ideas so that you get that two to four main points. 
Now from the remaining ideas, you're going to select anywhere from two to four that are the major points, or two to five really, that are the major points of your speech. So if it was for mine and the myths of the, of the pit bull, I might look at, okay, well I put the history of the pit bull, that was a kind of a big one that's got a lot of, of ideas that go with it, and the natural aggression is a big one, and the um, the the other other one I mentioned that's a big one. These are all big pieces, and I'd say, all right, I've got three myths here, and one history. That's my body. That's the main points: the history and the three myths. The history would be my informative uh, main point, and the myths would be my persuasive main point main points, okay? So that's how you're going to go through and figure out what you want to do. Now, if you have found in the past that you've got a way of identifying main points that works better than that, please feel free to do it. Another way might be to read a series of articles and look for common themes. That's a really easy way to do it as well and come up with main points based on that. I'm just giving you one of the ways I've done it in the past that's worked really well for me. So identify those main points first. What are the big ideas? Then organize them. So like I said, I've got history and then three separate of the myths. Now I'm going to choose my wording very carefully when I pick how I'm going to organize these main points. I want to clearly specify a relationship between each main point statement and the goal statement. So for example, I might say first, second, and third for all of those myths. I might say, even including with the history, I might say first we'll look at the history of the pit bull. And then when I get to main point two, I might say second we'll look at the myth of natural aggression, and so on. So I'm going to use very similar language that really connects to my overall goal. And I could even use verbs, and I'm going to show you a sample of that here in a second. The next is to choose an organizational pattern. So once you've used a language for those main points, and these can kind of be flip-flopped, but you choose a language and then you choose an organizational pattern or vice versa. And when we say organizational pattern, these are the ones that you typically see. Now there are others, feel free to Google your heart out of persuasive organizational patterns because there's a lot. And it really does depend on your topic, how you're going to do that. But typically what you see is topical, which is very much the myths of the pit bull one. None of those main points really need to go first, second, third, or fourth. They kind of could go anywhere and still work, so they're just organized by topic. Now chronological would be different. Chronological, as I'm sure you know, is by time, so it, one has to come first. So if you're doing a speech about the steps to recycling, well obviously the steps have to go in a certain order so your main point one would be your first step main point two would be your second step and so on so these would be a little different now that's harder for a persuasive speech however totally doable if you have the right speech um, becoming a better voter those kinds of things that might work because it's very persuasive so that's chronological then we have our problem solution so let's say you have the myths of the pit bull as your topic, main point one might be your history, and then main points two and three would be problem for number two and solution for number three. So what is the problem? The problem is that people view pit bulls in a certain light that I don't agree with. And what is the solution? How do we fix it? That would be your main points. So main point one, history, main point two, what is the problem? Why do people feel that pit bulls are these bad dogs? And main point three, what is the solution to fix this problem? And if I'm sure you could already figure out that the next one, problem cause solution, just adds an extra main point. These work really well for some speeches, some topics. They, they're really nice, uh, especially if you, your cause is also a part of your solution. So for example, I did a speech once on how to, or what the issue was with the ineffectiveness of some online classes. Well, I would first talk about, well, here's the problem, here's what's happening, and then I would share all those causes. What is making this happen? And then in the third main point, I would say, well, here are the solutions that we can come up with. 
and the solutions would be connected to the causes. Well, the cause might be A, B, C, and here's how we fix cause A, here's how we fix cause B, and here's how we fix cause C, and so on. So that might be an option. Now, another thing to note is that it could potentially work out that you can have your informative point be the problem or the cause. It depends on whether these are persuasive or not. Most of the time that will not work, but come talk to me if you think that that might be a possibility for you. It depends on your topic. In most cases, your informative point is going to be some kind of demonstration or some kind of history or timeline or background of some sort. Okay. So you're going to pick an organizational pattern and you're going to word those main points effectively. And like I said, you can use verbs as well and I will show you some of the ways to do that here in a minute. Now, what do I do? I mentioned a few things that I've done. I wanted to show you some images here. I like to make use of technology quite a bit. I don't know if you are a tech person or not, but for me it makes a huge difference. I use a couple of different apps. I use Notability. If you've ever heard of that, it is an app on a smartphone or a tablet that you can actually take a stylus and write onto PDF documents or onto a blank paper. And then I use Dropbox to hold all of that. So I'm going to show you my crazy highlighting that I mentioned earlier. This is what sometimes it'll look like. For example, I had this article right here that I was reading and I decided I was going to cat color code them, categorize them by some of the things students need for effectiveness in online instruction, some of the things instructors need, some of the things the institutions need, and then anything else that I thought was interesting but wasn't really categorized among those three. And then I started to read the article, anything that popped into my my category got highlighted that way. And I I took <laughs> Let's go back. I took all of this from multiple, multiple articles for this particular speech. I, I think there was 15 or 16 articles. And then I took that and I started to compile them. You can see down here, these are my notes. I would take the abstract from the article and I would go through and look at some of these highlights and make notes as to what I found in each article. And if you look over here, all of these have my notes for each of the individual articles and you can see how I've organized them. So I kind of color coded it. For me it works. It's very messy, but it works. You may be different. My husband likes to use Excel spreadsheets for organizing his data. That may be something that you find valuable. It's easier to organize and to find all the information, so it's really up to you how you organize your information. But I found this to be very helpful. All right. The next is once you've gotten that, once you know kind of where your main points go, what language you want to use to lay them out, then you can complete your thesis statement. And I don't know about you, but I have never been a big fan of writing thesis statements. They've always been a pain in the butt for me. I wasn't sure how to get the entirety of my paper or my speech into a sentence or two. I always had a problem with that until I came up with kind of the layman's way of doing it. So here's the definition. This is how I came up with this. This is the definition of a thesis statement. In a sentence or two, this outlines the specific elements that support your speech goal. The specific elements that support your speech goal. So that being said, I have kind of this, like I mentioned earlier, this mathematical slash very liberal creative mind. I have a very strange combination of the two. So I created a a little a little um, layout here, a little formula of a thesis statement. So how to combine these. And actually when you think about it, it's pretty easy. If you look at the definition, it outlines the number one specific elements. And what are those specific elements? Those specific elements are your main points. So your main points that support your speech goal, which is your specific purpose. I'm here to guide you through the myths of the pit bull. So here's our formula. The specific purpose plus the main points equals the thesis statement. So for me, it might be, I'm here to guide you through the myths of the pit bull, including natural aggression, uh, lockjaw, and anything else I want to throw in there. It is not pretty. 
It's very, very fundamental, and you can, once you get the idea of the thesis down, you can make it sound much more fluent, okay, much, much more uh, elaborate. But for the basic idea, if you just include your specific purpose with your main points, you should be okay. So I am here to guide you through the myths of the pit bull, including myth one, myth two, myth three. All right, let's say you picked music should be uh, pushed in school. We should continue to have music in school. So I am here to motivate you to continue music education because ABC, whatever your main points are. Okay, so this is your thesis statement. Once you have your main points laid out, you should be able to pretty easily come up with that thesis statement. And this is stated in the introduction, so don't forget, and you'll also recap it in the conclusion. Here is the sample speech goals and thesis statements I mentioned earlier, and they also give you kind of the verbs that I mentioned, so how you can use verbiage to set up the language for your main points. So for example, on this fir first one, let's say, or let's go to this last one where it has persuasion. Let's say, I want to persuade my audience is our general goal, then our specific goal, so our speech goal, would be, I want my audience to believe that parents should limit the time their children spend viewing television. Or you could say, I want to persuade my audience to limit the time children spend viewing television. Okay? Then your thesis statement would include that parents should limit the time their children spend viewing television, and then why, or your main points, because heavy television viewing desensitizes children to violence, and increases violent tendencies in children. And that's where those verbiages come in, those, the verb language, desensitizes and increases, okay? So you can use that to kind of create a theme in the language of your main points. But this is a great set of examples that if you need it, I think would provide you with good direction. Now, once you have the main points in your thesis, you can develop the subpoints and transition between them. And these are all things you're going to include in the outline, so make sure that you have it all set up the way you want it. Now, I have down here a couple of different examples of ways people have done it in the past. I mentioned earlier that I like to brainstorm and then color code. This is also a way to do it, and I have tried this before, and it does kind of work. It just depends on whether you have enough space on your floor or on your desk to use all the post-it notes. But, for example, I would put in one color the main points in a post-it note, and then I would write every fact or statistic or interesting quote or whatever on a yellow post-it note. And I hadn't categorized them yet, I just wrote everything that I thought I would want to include in my speech on a different post-it note. And then, I, and then I would take those and then organize them underneath each of the appropriate main points. So if I was, say, again, doing the myths of the pit bull, if I wrote a whole bunch of facts, one fact for every single piece of notebook, uh, or piece of uh, post-it note, and I wrote uh, statistics and all kinds of stuff. I would pull out every statistic that had to do with natural aggression and put it under the natural aggression post-it note, okay? So this is kind of how you are developing those. You're basically going to identify subpoints by sorting your research into the categories that correspond to each of your main points. So you're gonna take all of that research, all of that data, all of those facts and quotes and figures and, and statements, and you're going to put them underneath the corresponding main point. And you can do that in any way you want. You can color code things. You can actually use a post-it note. My husband uses a poster board for his classes. He organizes them that way. He'll actually cut up the syllabus and then paste the different assignments under the category that the assignment is. So it would be all all tests are due, or all, excuse me, all tests are under one category and all papers are under another. Or he can even do it by uh, month. So in October, here's all of those, these things that are due in October. Here's all of the things that are due in November. Here's all the things that are due in December and so on. So you can really do this with your research for your speeches as well. And you can do it again digitally and just create kind of this flow chart that works too. Really, it looks like a variety of options are available to you. Find what works for you. And don't be afraid to test a variety of different tools. I didn't figure out the, uh, the 
technology side of it, the use of highlighting onto PDFs and having everything there in Notability, easily accessible and easy to copy and paste. I didn't think about that until much later in life. So it's stuff like that that really is incredibly helpful when you test the waters a bit. But for these, identify those subpoints and then outline them in full sentences once you're ready. So start putting these things in full sentences once they're under the right points. Okay? Now, when you, if you're having trouble making sure you have enough variety in your support material, you could do the following thing, and I don't know whether this is helpful to you or not, so I'll just briefly discuss it. But oftentimes people feel like they're being kind of boring, and they don't want to sound boring. And one way to get away from that is to give a variety of types of support material. So subpoints that you're using, they can be developed even further with things like statistics, testimony, which is interviewing or finding quotes from people, and examples. And if you feel like you may be getting a little bit boring, try to organize your information by these categories and see how much you have. Because if you notice that you have a whole lot of statistics, you probably want to fix that because you will make it difficult for your people, to, your audience to follow along. And I just do it very simply. Here are all the examples I have, here are all the statistics I have, and here's all the testimony slash quotes that I have. Okay? And it's up to you whether you need that or not. If you fear that you're being boring, make sure you have a lot of different types of support material as opposed to just a whole bunch of statistics or just a whole bunch of quotes. Okay? Now, the next piece here is the transitions taking you from one point to the next. I know you all know what transitions are. I, I f do not fear that you are incapable of creating a transition. What I, I don't think many people understand is that a transition for a speech is a little bit different from a transition in a paper. As we've said a million times, a paper is easier to follow along with than a speech. Once you miss or zone out during a speech, it's over. Unless it's recorded, there's no going back. In a paper, you can go back and reread or make sure you understood a point correctly. In a live speech, that's not possible. So creating transitions for a public speaking experience is going to be a little bit more straightforward than you might do for a paper. So transitions, as you know, are any word or phrase or even full sentences that show the relationship between the two ideas. In our cases, the relationship between the introduction and the first main point, the relationship between all of the main points, and then the relationship between the last main point and the conclusion. Now, good, good transitions are absolutely vital for formal public speaking. And I have seen people that train <laughs> solely on transitions. They actually do physical movement that correlates with the transitions where in each moment that they transition from one point to another they move across the room and they stop when they're done transitioning. So you could even do that. But it, what I would recommend highly is what we call a signpost. These are the most blunt of transitions and the easiest for your audience to follow along with. If you've ever been on a hike or watched a movie where you've seen those sort of crisscross signs in the ground that say if you go in this direction you're going to this city and if you go in that direction you're going to that city. Um, when I'd gone down to the um, Harry Potter world in, in, in Disney or in uh, Orlando, there's a big signpost there in the Harry Potter world that says if you go this way you go to Hogwarts, if you go that way you go to Hogsmeade. So that's what I mean when I say a signpost. There, it's an actual sign that is posted to show you which direction goes where. Well the speech signpost kind of has the same idea. You're basically saying now that you've come from here you're gonna go here. So if I was doing the Miss of the Pitbull speech and one main point was natural aggression and the other main point was um, lockjaw, I would say now that I've told you all about how Pitbulls ha are perceived to have lockjaw, let me share with you the myth of natural aggression. So it says here's where I was and here's where I'm going. 
please use those in your in your speech. I want you to try that in your speech. If you feel like you've got a more creative or a different way that you want to test it, let me know and we'll talk about it. But for now, let's use the signpost. I think those are the best route to take for our particular kinds of speeches. Okay, and I'm going to show you here, this is the last thing I want to play. These are just a couple of very quick transition samples that I think give you a good idea of what a signpost does and how transitions work in public speaking. So we're going to listen to just a few of these real quick. Now that we have a clear understanding of the problem, let me share my solution with you. I've spoken so far of bravery and of patriotism, but it is the sacrifice of the 54th that has etched them into the pages of history. Now that we've seen how drinking too much is a serious problem for students and their communities, let's look at some causes. Keeping these points in mind about sign language, let's return to the sentence I started with and see if we can learn the signs, for you are my friend. Now that we've taken a look at what feng shui is, let's put this newfound knowledge into practice. All right, so you can see these are uh, very similar in nature. They all have the same kind of idea, but the point being they're easier to follow. It's easier for your audience to go, okay, yeah, that's right. That's what we were talking about, and this is what we're getting ready to talk about. So try to use these in your speeches. Hopefully this stuff gives you a good idea of how to organize your information and make sure everything is categorized correctly worded correctly, and then organized and transitioned in a way that is clear for you and clear for your audience. You know where to find me if you have any questions.